Good evening, everyone. I'm Jenny Lee. And I'm Shanira. And we have a great guest speaker this evening. Her name is Jen Taylor, who is not just a mom, but a podcast owner, a coach, and book author. She will be joining us to talk about her testimony. Hi, Jen. Welcome. Hi. Thank you so much for having me on. We are honored to have you. Well, so I'm excited. Let's <laughs> <laughs> good, 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 good. So can you share a little bit about um, a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Um, you mentioned I am an author. I, I wrote my book just over five years ago, and it was my story growing up in dysfunction. And when I wrote that, I was like, I wrote a book and it's out there and everybody <laughs> should write a book. And this is so great because I love the story and I, I'm proud that I got mine out there. However, I definitely understand mine is one and there's a lot of power in one story. Mm -hmm. I wanted many to share their story so that that power of one was multiplied kind of compound interest, which I love. I love compound interest. So nine months later, my husband's best friend handed me a microphone. He had a very successful podcast and he's like, start a podcast. And the podcast follows the same formula as my book. You know, you talk about the past and how hard it is. You really dig deep into the struggle. I don't try to get people to cry, but I want you tapped in at that level to your emotion. Yes. Because I, I want other people to feel less alone. And mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. through their story, they share the who, what, when, where, how they got through or are still getting through those struggles because we're building that toolbox. Mm -hmm. I attract entrepreneurs. So almost all of my guests have been entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So we also kind of promote who they are in their business. I'm a coach. You mentioned that. <laughs> but I'm sorry. I'm laughing because I feel like you're my podcast twin. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, even though I'm a coach and not everybody, it's just like my book, not everybody's going to resonate with me or my story. So I'm giving mm -hmm. options like, yes, I'm a coach and yes, this is my story, but here are other coaches and other stories because I think the world just needs to be uplifted and I want to spread yeah. that gratitude and changing people's lives in a really positive way. So that's kind of the book to the podcast and a little loop in that I do some coaching too. That's amazing. And I love how uh, we can impact others just by being who we are and yes. uh, sharing our stories because mm -hmm. when we go through things, we don't see it as something that can impact people in the long run. But when we, you know, take ourselves out of the situation or whatever, whatever your testimony may be, um, it's actually a, a manifestation to help others. Yep. So I love, I love that you're, um, you're doing that because that's what we do as well on Uncommon mm -hmm. Women, which is amazing. Uh, so let's get into that. Can you tell us a little bit about your life and how was everything growing up? I grew up in a lot of dysfunction. I grew up, like if you think foster kids, how a foster child grows up, I grew up the same way. We weren't put into foster care. I remember CPS coming to the house and driving away and probably being about 10 and wondering why I, my sister and I weren't in the car. So it's, it's very interesting as a child, you know that like this isn't the way things are supposed to be, but you have nothing to compare that to. Mm -hmm. And I knew things were definitely either not the way they should be, or that there were other ways to do things or better. Or I, I just, I knew I wanted to get out. I kept a bag packed underneath my bed uh, for years to escape. Mm. And I, I've made the comment, like we spent a lot of time out on the street. People are like, oh, how awful. Well, not if your home is a scarier place than the street is. Mm. My third grade teacher made such a tremendous pivotal difference in my life. And this is how I know that just by being yourself in passing, Usually, often, without even knowing that you made a difference, you can make a tremendous difference in the life of someone else. Things in my home life got considerably worse after third grade, but I knew I was worth it to her. And for me, that's all that I needed to kind of get through some really, really horrific stuff. The mm -hmm. other thing, you know, we're all unique personalities. I don't ever remember a moment in my life where I didn't have tremendous faith or a moment in my life where I didn't know God existed. And so I had some sort of uh, internal in the fiber of who I am. That's just right. part of my DNA. 
my mom said at one point she i was a little kid five or six and she came out onto the porch i was sitting out on the steps and she said who are you talking to and i said i'm talking to jesus because i thought everybody just sat outside on the porch <laughs> and talking to jesus right <laughs> and that's pretty much been my mo my whole life i have not always been good at outwardly expressing my faith is very personal it's one thing that i've never wanted attacked um it's the most intimate part of me emotionally. And so because of that, because I've protected it, I have been passive, which is something mm -hmm. retrospectively, I think mm -hmm. I regret. No, I'm not in Japan. I am, <laughs> <laughs> I am in Reno, Nevada, and it's my background because behind <laughs> that is the treadmill. So <laughs> It's a beautiful background. I like thank it. You, thank you, Amazon. Right. I it's can the send clothes you the for the treadmill. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. Don't be sorry. Um, it's yes. You know, we put our offices in closets and living rooms, and it was my nightstand for a long time was my office. So we just make it. I have an actual room, but the treadmill shares. It's amazing. <laughs> so, um, you know, as a kid growing up, innately, I had this faith and belief in God. And I had this teacher that made a huge difference. But I was absolutely embroiled in dysfunction. So that was another, you know, they're what I like to call a God shot. There are God shots, right? These little mm -hmm. things that happens like the drop in the bucket, right? This drop in the bucket that happens where maybe at the moment you didn't realize it, but later you do. Right. And my teacher was more than a God shot. She was absolutely like part of my salvation. I can't imagine my trajectory without her. Wow. Truly, truly. Um, I could, we, I think we all have some darkness within us. Mm -hmm. And I could have gone down a very, very different path. And knowing that I was worth it to her, to this human being that I adored, who thought I was smart and funny and just worthy, made such a tremendous impact. So that mm -hmm. was a drop, though, that lesson. The lesson was a drop that you can make an amazing difference in someone else's life just by being you, mm -hmm. often in passing, without ever knowing about it. I did fly back to where I grew up in Rhode Island 21 years ago, I found her. I flew back. I was pregnant. I had five kids in tow. I wow. spent a weekend wow. with her because I can tell the story to a million people. And if she doesn't know, that's such a disservice. And I was able mm -hmm. to thank her. Yes. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And another thing was growing up as a kid who should have been in foster care, who went through that dysfunction, it gave me uh, a very unique set of skills. So I was developing this skill set as I was growing up that you don't realize at six or at nine. But when I wrote the book, I was writing, you know, like in hindsight, in my 40s, when I wrote, this is what I was learning as a six year old mm -hmm. or a nine year old. Or, and we're building this like toolbox of skills that we can utilize and they can be really tragic and not great for us and not healthy and they can be really positive. And so I never wanted to make another human being feel like I felt growing up. Hmm. And that was really important to me. Wow. So the book's name is hello. My name is warrior princess and I will email anyone who wants one, a PDF copy. <laughs> so just let these girls know and yep, we'll get into that and Mark. Get, <laughs> get ahead of ourselves so that was kind of my upbringing i was in a cult for 17 years and so coming wow. out wow. yeah so i've always considered myself a christian I, my heart wasn't any different i didn't i didn't realize that i was in the wrong place or you don't stay in a cult for 17 years being brainwashed you know um I, I felt like I was doing the right thing and I was in the right place. Mm -hmm. And I know my heart was, and it's interesting at all these points in my life, I remember, you know, someone will make a comment it, and it can be positive or negative, but they make this comment and you go, yeah, God and I are good. So you mm -hmm. can just back up mm -hmm. off, you know? Right. So you, you just realize that it's really my relationship with God. That was the most important. Yeah. But, and I've said, to a fault because I was passive with others. However, with me, I was good. It was good with God. So, um, yeah. How did you realize that you were like, it was an actual cult? Like wh where was the aha moment 
um, in your life? Because you said you were in it for 17 years. Did you know in the beginning this is what you were committing to? Or is it just something that prolonged and you was like, you know what? I believe that this is this is a call. <laughs> Um, it, well, that's a great question that no one has asked me. I didn't realize that it was in the beginning. No. Oh my gosh. No. You know, you show up. I was a 17 year old kid. I mm -hmm. joined this, the church the same month I graduated high school and I was 17. Mm -hmm. I had grown up in all this dysfunction. I was desperately searching for a, a platform that I could share my faith. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make sure that the King James Bible was used because I wanted it unfiltered. This was my 17 year old brain. Okay. Um, although I still really like the King James Bible or at least the new, you know, I like less filtering. Don't water it down for me. I need, right. I need things word for word now. And I was desperate for family values. So mm -hmm. When you are a 17 year old desperate for family values coming from dysfunction and my, my checklist was real small. I was ripe for the picking. I was absolutely, mm -hmm. it was so easy to tell me the things that I needed to hear that I wanted to hear. And also in cults, when you're slowly indoctrinated, you, you know, I remember seeing bell bottom jeans and thinking like, I am never wearing bell bottom jeans. But then you keep seeing them and you keep seeing them. And then all of a sudden, not only do you like them, you're buying yourself a pair of bell-bottom jeans, right? Mm -hmm. It's boiling the frog. So when, when you slowly get information, slowly get information, abuse is very, very similar to a mm -hmm. cult, right? You don't walk in and flip the light switch right. on. It's a dimmer <laughs> all the way. Mm -hmm. If you walked in and smacked me upside the head, I would probably immediately know that there was something wrong in this right. relationship. Yeah. It's not like that. It's slow and insidious. It's boiling the frog. And so did I know in the beginning? Absolutely not. I thought I had hit the Mecca and the jackpot. And then you kind of get sucked into it. And honestly, you don't know how to get out. And also, you're, you're being so manipulated at that point mm -hmm. that you think it's you. It is, it is exactly the same as an abusive relationship. You mm. think, oh, maybe I'm asking too many questions. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's my lack of faith. Wow. And mm -hmm. when fear and manipulation are being used to keep you somewhere, and then, you know, I got married and mm -hmm. to someone else in this call. It's just, it becomes this thing where you kind of don't even know how to get out or if you should yeah. get out. And your, your mind has been so messed up. I just, I hit a point where I left the marriage and the church at the wow. same time. No. You, you have to hit this bottom. Mm -hmm. And I lost, I lost everything. I lost all support, all family connection um, from his side of the family, which was where, because you're, you're also like, you're cut off a little bit from your own family. You're cut off. Yeah. Like all your friends oh, are at the church, mm -hmm. all your family. Wow. Like, mm -hmm. So I, I left with nothing. I left with nothing and no friends and not knowing anyone. And um, I left my marriage. It was really, really hard. And I just think just like an abusive relationship, something crosses the line and it may not even be one that like this thing happened. It's a final drop in the bucket right. that happens yeah. that kind mm -hmm. of puts you at capacity. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I walked away from everything. So my Christian journey, although I really, I'm going to be 51. When I look back over my life, like I haven't changed what I want hasn't changed. My Christian beliefs haven't changed. My faith and my values haven't changed. However, how I project that has changed significantly. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Mm. 17 years. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. definitely took some courage, you know, to just detach from everything and, you know, make a decision like, you know, if I do decide to do this, it's it's gonna be me against everyone yeah. else, you know? And um, it was me against everyone else. Yeah. I, I've lived that a few times in my life. You know, I felt that mm -hmm. way as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I was also a mom who was an advocate for my kids. And I had been mm -hmm. doing advocacy work for a long time. And then you realize like, oh, it's like yourself you need to be an advocate for. Did not mm -hmm. see that one coming. Yeah. But now we're here. 
<laughs> I'm good at the hard stuff. I'm good at getting through it. Right. Uh, I'm super resilient. I have tenacity. And then I'm an advocate. So when you put that together and you actually do it for yourself, big, big things happen very quickly. So absolutely. Yeah. When you said that you, you had five children when you went to go see um, your teacher. How did you get from five to 18 children? Oh, 18 <laughs> kids. I, uh, I think we held this one blessings. back a little bit. 18 right? blessings. Yeah. <laughs> that is one way to say it. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> For all you parents out there, first of all, it's not a competition. One child makes you a parent. 18 <laughs> kids. Yes, I have 18 kids. So another drop in the bucket. I was 15. I, I had issues, female issues, I don't mind talking about. But okay. Being, Things with my cycle. I had not started my period. I was almost 16 years old. My mom was totally freaked out. I went to an OBGYN because that, like, that's pretty old for not having one. Yeah, I was, yeah. like, retrospectively, I'm like, school, whoop, whoop. a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> being, a mom, being a woman now is like 16, <laughs> right? So she brought me to an OBGYN. Um, other than the fact that I had been molested growing up, this was the first man who touched me below the waist, right? Wow. I remember he was like 6'2". He was the kindest, most, it was such a great experience. And I wish women were more open to the fact that, you know, I went in there naively, so I had no preconceived notion on a male doctor. Mm -hmm. And I think because I came in doctor. with that attitude, mm -hmm. right? Oh. So he did a mild, I, I was a virgin, he did a, an exam. And it was interesting. He, and I like, again, I'm 51 and I've gone through a lot. And he said to me, and I don't know why, but I'm so grateful he did. You're probably going to have a really hard time having children. Be prepared to go through infertility. You're, you're, it's, it's going to be okay. At this point, there's nothing that we need to do or can do. And so we're just going to leave you alone. I started my period later. I was about 16. He um, told you, at, I'm sorry, at he, didn't tell your, he didn't tell your parents and like, you know, have the, he just flat out. Well, told I think my mom was in the room. I don't really remember. Okay, I don't, okay. but I know sorry. I was sitting there for the, like, I was definitely sitting there for the conversation, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, he, he didn't eliminate me from the conversation, which was very, I was felt very human. Right. I felt very seen by mm -hmm. him through just like the tenderness of the experience as mm -hmm. a 15 year old virgin who had been molested. He didn't know that about me. Right. Right. He was just a really good guy that was a good doctor that treated me like a human being with kindness. Mm -hmm. It was interesting, though, because he said that to me. And I, a 15 year old doesn't really think much about that. Like, yeah, oh, no, not at all. See you later. Peace out. Right. <laughs> right. Um, I just went on with my life and. I did go through infertility. And mm -hmm. so, but it was that drop in the bucket and my third grade teacher that made me realize like, I want to do foster care. Mm -hmm. I was one of those kids. And if she made such a difference to me, like I can make a difference to one. Yes. You yeah. just want to make a difference to that one. So it was, it was, it was another little God shot that I did not hash out in my 15 year old brain, but I went through infertility. I went through about nine months of infertility. There were seven surgeries, day surgeries you go through. I was wow. maxed out on Clomid and Provera. So anyone wow. who's gone through infertility knows what these seven surgeries are. They know they feel like someone has possessed your body and it's not a good person. Oh, wow. um, when you're on all this medication, it really, you, you feel like you're losing your mind when you're maxed wow. out on infertility. And we got up to the point for in vitro fertilization and I, I married the first time the marriage nobody knows about. I was married at 19 and we were together for three years. And this happened then. I was 20 when I went through infertility. And I went through infertility mm -hmm. because I either had no period for months and months and months. Okay. Or I'd have one and be in the hospital hemorrhaging. Yeah. Oh my so goodness. there was no happy medium. So it wasn't necessarily that I went to him at 20 trying to get pregnant. However, the tests to figure out what's wrong with you are the same. I was married. We did want to have kids. Right. And so I, I was for all intents and purposes. I was, I the went process. through infertility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I went on a medication to help me get pregnant. Right. Okay. But I was 20 years old. So I was very young.
Mm -hmm. uh, we hit in vitro fertilization and I looked at him and I said, I'm so grateful. This is not my path for any women who head down the IVF. I, yes, my husband was supportive through this. He wanted kids, but we were very young. Um, I, I wave, like I white flagged it. I, I give you so much credit for going down that path. I knew at 20 years old, that was not my path. And again, mm -hmm. my, my whole life, I felt pretty in tune with right. my faith and with God. And yeah. so I just felt that, and I'm a visual person. I'm a logical person. My husband is the more emotional of the two of us. <laughs> and yet, if you're talking about the Holy Spirit, I'm all there, all that. Like I, that one, I, that one I feel. <laughs> so I knew IVF wasn't for me. He was weaning me off the medication. He was doing blood work. He, he came into the room one day doing blood work and he was like, I'm almost five foot nine. He mm -hmm. was probably like five, five mm -hmm. Asian man, right? This little, <laughs> little guy. <laughs> I'm like this five, nine Amazonian extrovert. I probably <laughs> just bowled this man up. Totally <laughs> but he walked in the door and he hugged me. And I was like, it's one of those, like, I don't know what I was <laughs> <laughs> just wondering. I'm a hugger. But, um, <laughs> but she was not expecting that at all. Not, again, no. <laughs> not from him, not there, not then. Not. So he said, congratulations, you're pregnant. This Aww. is a miracle from God. There is no physical way you should be able to get pregnant, although we can't figure out what's wrong with you. Expect to have a tough pregnancy and expect that you may not ever be able to get pregnant again. And any doctor who takes you on would put you directly into IVF. You'd pick up where you, you left off basically with infertility. So wow. that just gave me chills. Like God, oh, wow. baby, a God. Yes. Baby. <laughs> I don't know where I love that. Oh my God. I had Brie when I was 21. I was transported from a birthing center with a midwife. I wanted to have natural childbirth and all mm -hmm. that stuff. And she was very intuitive. She just looked at me at 37 weeks and she's like, your body's fighting labor. Like it's kind of in labor. Something's not right. You can pick one of two hospitals, but you're transporting. And there was no reason except I had, I, it was a very difficult pregnancy. Mm. However, there was no reason except that this woman was really in tune with me and, and her job essentially to be a midwife. Right. So I transferred to the hospital and they did a whole bunch of tests and they knew that my daughter was going to be born sick. They didn't know how sick they knew that keeping her inside was solved some problems, but created others and having her born on the outside solved some problems and created Absolutely. others. And they right. really didn't know. Okay. So now my, my, husband at the time was military and we were separated. I, uh, my sister was there, but I was a 21 year old having my first baby in a different state, pretty much by myself. Wow. So they told me that they would do a bedside evaluation. And I was in new, it was in New Hampshire at the Dartmouth Hitchcock medical center. Shout out to them. Training facilities are just uh, astounding. So they asked me if I could have students in the room. And I said, yes. And they said, oh, wow. I, 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 I'm like, everybody come watch the show. I, like, oh, I experienced that. Yeah, I, like, like, yes. okay. I had experienced that too for my daughter. They were like, kids, they can come in. I had a room full of people. So like, go right ahead. I wasn't even. Yeah. How many people in my room? Oh, I had a lot of people. I, can't remember. I, don't know, I can't remember how many. I was at birth. I couldn't remember, but yeah. I know there was a lot of people. We have it on video, and I was like, there are 20 people. Anyway. I use that for the class now. I'm just saying. <laughs> they should. I did it. Right. I, I nailed it. They, 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 owe you a check. they owe you a check, girl. <laughs> <laughs> so she was born. They told me that they would do a bedside evaluation and that if she was really critical, they would hand her back to me and she would die in my arms. Oh, and right. if they were going to do life saving, then they would get her out of the room. So I knew this. And so, so as soon as I started to push, they hit this button on the wall. I remember the nurse hitting this, this red button on the wall. And I remember, you know, you're looking down, I'm pushing and you're looking down. I remember looking up and being like, holy cow, the room, like the room was full. And I had Brie and they did the bedside evaluation. 
um, I didn't hear anything for seven hours. And then Ned, the head neonatologist came back in who panic button. Yeah. Was for me. Um, the head neonatologist came in seven hours later. I have no idea what's going on with my daughter. And she said, if we had known how critical she was at the beginning, we would have handed her back to you to die in your arms. She will not live through her first 72 hours. Mm. The first time you will hold your daughter is after she's passed away. You can't touch babies in the NICU um, because they burn so many calories being touched. So you touch them. Yeah. Actually, mm -hmm. possible. Wow. So there were 29 babies in the NICU and she was the most critical and um, I got released the next day because I was fine and I was sleeping in waiting rooms and in the hallway and a because like my daughter's going to die in the first three days. I'm definitely um, not leaving this hospital. So a nurse found me and she brought me to the nurse's station. She let me shower. She connected me with a lactation consultant. Again, these people who just give you so much grace, who just are, you know, angels in the midst that help you. Yeah. And there was a place you could stay when you had um, a, people in critical care, but I didn't want to like take the shuttle bus there to go stay there. I wanted to be at the hospital so that when my daughter passed away, I could hold her in my arms for the first time. Right. Yeah. There were a group of us that were in a room off to the side of the NICU and um, the night of day two, she was hitting 48 hours, who all knelt in prayer. And that night she turned the corner. She is now 29 and a half years old. Oh my and goodness. One of the most outstanding human beings that I have had the privilege of knowing and I am beyond grateful and honored that I was Aww. chosen to be her mom. So Amazing. that experience wow. made me realize that I was not going to go through infertility and that if I got pregnant on my own, that would be beautiful. However, I really wanted to do foster care and help the kids that were like me that needed it. Mm -hmm. So I did, I uh, was remarried. I started foster care. Um, I did get pregnant seven times in total, which negates infertility. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. <laughs> wow, that's I, amazing. I gave birth to four okay. daughters. The last thing. And all three, girls. All Look girls. Oh my goodness. All periods. <laughs> oh, you have no idea, I guess. That. So. Oh. <laughs> um, I have 12 girls and six boys total. Wow. So, so um, I had home births. I had two of them in the, as water births. So I, I had four and I lost three. And on my last three, um, on my, uh, on my last pregnancy at 33 years old, I lost twins at 19 weeks. And these are things that ladies, we don't talk about enough. Mm -hmm. Right. Very true. We, we should talk about periods and OBGYN mm -hmm. appointments and our first sexual experiences right. and our current sexual experiences. And we should be talking about pregnancy and delivery and breastfeeding and miscarriage and hysterectomies and feeling like you're failing as a mom. And we don't. We attack each other instead. And I yep. think it's Very a true. huge, huge mm -hmm. service. Yes. Right? Yes. I agree. Yes. So for me people say, oh, you took on extra kids. And I'm like, actually, I delivered extra kids because I did not expect those to make it. And when I had my hysterectomy, the doctor did say, I, and I, again, I don't, I wasn't in there with him, but he did say that he had no idea how I got pregnant and maintained a pregnancy. Um, after the hysterectomy, I had internal bleeding and I went back into wow. surgery. He had to call a second surgeon. I was dead on the table. They cut me hip to hip, took everything out, suctioned the blood out of my abdomen, processed it through a machine, gave me five blood transfusions, three wow. of them. So those 10 surgeries total and seven pregnancies were very traumatic on my body. Oh my uh, they were worth it, but they were traumatic. Yeah. Yes. And it was kind of like, that's like the side story because really my whole goal was that I really wanted to do foster care. And I did. So after Brie was born, I signed up for foster care and her, then her sister was born four years later. And I wanted to do foster care for kids where they knew they didn't have this, this could be their final home. So I was in the foster adoption program 
And I did, I, I don't know how many kids have come through my house. I did foster care that didn't stay permanently. Although really the, the majority of what I wanted to do, I wanted kids to come to my house and never have to leave. So mm -hmm. I, I, I gave birth to four at that point. I adopted four and I had two that were long-term. One was a foreign exchange student and one was okay. long-term in foster care. Nice. And um, she came to me when she was nine and she's now 32 and she was here two weeks ago with my three grandbabies. And so, um, then I was divorced again and left the cult <laughs> like surprise mm -hmm. at that point i had eight kids at home i had stayed at home really in that time frame in that 10 11 years that i was wow. married i really like i was a stay-at-home mom i did foster care i made my own baby food i baked bread i homeschooled my kids i was Super very happy yeah like I was doing, I did a lot of training through foster care. I taught volunteer classes to adults through the, um, there was a preschool program. I'll think of it. Head Start, Head Start. Oh, okay. I'm so with that. I worked with low income families a lot. Um, I really, there was so much about that that was so incredibly exceptional mm -hmm. that I just really, really loved. When I left the church and the marriage, I was working three jobs and I had eight kids Oof. under... I wow. had eight kids, 12 and under, and I was on my own with those eight kids. And what did I do? Kept doing foster care. I adopted wow. one more. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you counting, there were 10 kids and eight at home. I kept doing foster wow. care and I adopted one more and I took three more long-term. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had nine to 12 kids at home okay. a lot. Like I've never had more than 12 at home. Like there's a lot of years where there were nine to 12 kids at home. A lot, a lot of years, nine to 12 kids. Wow. But I've never had more than 12 of them. As a matter of fact, the picture I uh -huh. use for most things, my I have this banner picture uh -huh. and I, re, I use it for two reasons. One, it was six years ago and 14 kids are in that picture and I've never gotten 14 kids in a picture before that or after that. I was about to say, how can you hurt? Like, there's no perfect shot with 14. No, there isn't. I it, was imagine. it was pretty good. It's pretty good. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> when you make these beautiful children. Oh. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> um, and also, my son, who would be 28 now, is in the picture and he died five years ago. So for two reasons, I will probably never stop using that picture as my, my um, banner picture. So yeah, that's how I, so that's 14 for those of you keeping track. So then my daughter, Brie, infamously, you know, the mm -hmm. famous one now, she <laughs> was 20 okay. and she wanted to fix me up on dates with a mutual friend of ours. And I was really not super excited about that. I have to say, I, <laughs> you had a lot going on. <laughs> she was trying to hook her mama up, though. <laughs> there were nine kids at home at that time. Like, there's an ebb and flow of kids in and out and stuff, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. there were nine kids at home. I was down to working one job. Um, okay, things were better. I, I, you know, I had a pretty good life. My mm -hmm. personal life was good. And there was parts of my personal life that my then 20 year old daughter didn't know about that, you know, like, <laughs> right. like mom, you need to, you need to have somebody to do activities with. And I'm like, I do have friends. Some of, right. them, are, <laughs> some of them are male. I'm not totally alone all the right. time. Yeah. We, we let that go. Right. We let that go. Yeah. So she and and a really good friend of mine started fixing me up on dates. And <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> they would they would screen them, but they would screen them through conversation. It was awesome. Really. I was so not on board. But if I ever am single again, I'm calling you two girls. We're doing the exact same thing. Okay. <laughs> so they would screen them through conversation and then they would meet them for coffee. Like at Starbucks. Oh wow, they were and like, if they, oh man, they were like, oh, wow. I I had them print all the paperwork from then. I still have it. I'm telling you, we could start a business. A dating. I'm about yeah. to start. <laughs> I mean, they're sitting there screaming. They had a whole dating. Yeah, they are doing all the stuff. Why not start a, a dating business? <laughs> that so is hilarious. <laughs> if it went well when they met for coffee, 
they would give me his phone number and I could text and I could set up my copy. Mm -hmm. So um, it was, <laughs> it was um, fun. It was, I, I was kind of like, yeah, it's really nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, I wasn't here. I was, I was humoring them. I could have had way more fun with it. Uh, anyway, so one of the people that I met, I, I genuinely, I gave him a hard time about this just the other day. Genuinely, I genuinely thought like we, the first weekend we met, I thought like it was a fun weekend. It's nice, it's nice, it's nice to meet you. Tuesday? Tuesday. Like, <laughs> So that's beyond, Friday, right. but, but, um, you know, I got Dane's number. We texted for a week. We had one phone conversation. I did everything I could to dissuade him from wanting to meet me and go out on a date with me. He still wanted to meet me. And, go, oh, man. and I remember he was so sarcastic. And I thought, please, please let this texting person be him in real life. In right. Mm -hmm. Cause I know I am, but I like, yeah, don't use your high school picture. And it was kind of like that. And I, we met, we changed where we were meeting. Mm -hmm. And I, of course I parked in a place where I can see the entire. Right. right? <laughs> <laughs> so I get a text from him that says, oh, I'm meeting you at this place. The first place we were supposed to meet. And I said, that's a shame since we were supposed to meet at this place. I guess we'll just have to, it was just not meant to be, but I'm watching him walk across the parking lot. <laughs> not meant to be send you know and he stops and i can see him like no wait no i'm here i'm just kidding you know like and by then i'm walking across the parking lot and i like i said i'm five nine so i had some criteria minimum of six foot two that's right yeah of course of course five ten <laughs> <laughs> Did you not get the memo, girls? Did you not? <laughs> the description was 6'2". We're going to go wrong with this. <laughs> and uh, I had said it could be five years in either direction of my age, and he was mm -hmm. four years younger. But I knew Dane had four children. Like, I can't fault him for that. Right? Oh, another criteria was could not have children younger than my youngest. Okay. She's eight years. His youngest is eight years younger than my youngest. Like, hmm. 5'10", younger child than my youngest child. <laughs> no, didn't fit. Did not fit at all. Um, and his wife had died. Mm -hmm. That's great. Like, that's baggage I want to take on, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, yeah. And and my friend Lacey, who is fam fantasy football, she's like, she's like the woman who will beat the crap out of all of the dudes at fantasy football, right? She's, <laughs> She's a protector. She's a protector. She, she is. A when she was telling me about Dane, she started to cry. And I'm like, are you seriously Aww. crying right now? <laughs> he touched her. You know, and yeah. she's like, Jen, he's the one. And I'm like, he's the one for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Not for me. How many okay, dates so before you met him? I'm just curious. They met him. They saw him once. They had talked to him for like three or four weeks, though. Okay. He was actually the first person that they started talking to, but he wasn't the first person I met. Okay. With no. scheduling. And okay. I had texted him for a week, and we had one phone conversation when we met. And she goes, if you don't date him, if you don't like him, I'm going to help him find somebody else and I'm going to drop you. And I'm like, oh, I'm on that team. Let's go. Let's get him fixed up. Right. So I walked up to him and we hugged. And I thought that at that moment, I was like, oh, oh, that's, there's something. Mm-mm. That's interesting. We're just going to shove that down, that feeling down, right? Because mm -hmm. he connected and um, it was just a hug in the parking lot. But I was like, oh, I'm in trouble. We need to abort mission, abort mission. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, you know, when we first sat down, I, I did. I had my arms crossed and and he, he just kept being <laughs> rude. I was not being rude, but I was also not being real welcoming, right? Mm -hmm. I was just, I was pretty, and I'm not reserved as you just ladies know. <laughs> I was just distancing myself a okay. little bit, but we kept talking and there was a point in time 
that he made me laugh so hard. And I uncrossed my arms and I leaned forward on the table like this. And he said, I've got her. Because he knew I had just let my guard down and now we could have a real conversation. And we've, oh, been, wow. together. we've been together since that hug. Oh, see, besties is always right. <laughs> she <told> yep. <laughs> so that's where the other four kids came from. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I went back to having a child who was, it was like her fourth birthday and I right. so did not want to go back and do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I have some of his wife's ashes in my closet, which sounds super weird. And it was hard to get through in the beginning. And then mm -hmm. it, it wasn't. And I remember a point where like his older daughter his three older kids are all the same age as my older kids. Mm -hmm. And just to like bridge the gap over this last many years, right? Our kids are all really, really great friends. A lot of them live together because all the kids are adult. That four-year-old is now right. 12. Um, and she, yep, she's 12. And uh, it's been eight years. And our kids are all adults and out adults of the house now. now. Mm -hmm. And so they all live together. Girl. They're all good. Just just the 12-year-old at home. Ooh, spoiled. Oh, wow. Oh, she's not. She got she's the not? worst end of us. Um, you know. oh. <laughs> so, like, we've done 17 of you. So, right. you're probably not going to cry, sure you, sister. You everything, right? <laughs> I look at her, I'm like, really? Do you, like, do you know? Do you know who you're talking you about? You got 11 other sisters. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's been, that was 18. And so, the ashes, his older daughter did, did, bring out this little box of ashes and I was like oh my gosh I have I have just hit the point that I am out of my comfort zone like I have mm -hmm. bitten off more than I can chew and I was like dang I just like I, I super love you and everything but why do you have your wife's ashes and why are they in a closet in our house and when she died, she had a brother and a sister and her sister was 15. Mm -hmm. And Dane kept aside some of the ashes because her sister was kind of a train wreck then, still is now. It's been, um, you know, 11 years since his wife died and 10 and a half years. Um, she hasn't, that hasn't changed a whole lot. Right. Mm -hmm. And he kept some of the ashes thinking that when her family or his, her siblings got older and wanted to have some closure over their sister dying, that he would give them these ashes. And I remember eight years ago looking at him and going, that's not what they're for. They're for my 11 year old daughter. I think she and her dad are going to get some closure. She's going to get the closure from her mom. She yeah. was two years old when her mom died. And, um, mm -hmm. I have held on to them. Although once, um, yeah. And you know, once you have a different, I want to point this out that most often in a situation, one thing, the one thing we can control is our own attitude and thought process and perception is projection. Mm -hmm. So what we feel we're projecting out. And this is a really great example that when I first had dead wife's ashes in my closet, it made me uncomfortable. I felt mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like, do you need closure? Is there a reason why they're here? Right. I, I'm, I'm not comfortable with this. And all he had to do is say, yeah, I saved them for her sister and her sister's family. And I, I knew the story behind it. And I went, oh, and it goes from being uncomfortable to what a sweet guy, right? Like mm -hmm. that's, those are not the same. That's quite a pendulum of emotion. So the thing is though, that that was all my attitude and my perception. And the second that you stop and ask a question and gain some clarity and your perception shifts. So does everything around you. Right. And um, that's just a good learning lesson to pass on to people that sometimes we hear things or we're presented with a situation that make makes our hackles raise or makes us uncomfortable or is something that we don't understand. And when you realize that you're experiencing those discomforts in, within your body, just take a step back and ask questions. It's a wonderful time to be super curious. Mm -hmm. And when you're curious and you have, you, you learn things from that different perspective, then your attitude completely shifts. There was a time several years ago, we, we did have 12 kids living at home and in Rio, Nevada, there were fires that were coming really close to our house. Yeah. We were the next neighborhood to evacuate. 
So I actually left work that day and I came home to pack the car and uh, his older daughter called me from school, like just so distraught and said, you need to put Danielle in the car. Weird conversations you have in my house. So Danielle is the mom who died. And I was like, it's a fire. She's ashes. Like, maybe we'll just finally release her, you know, like, mm -hmm. I, but I put Danielle in the car. Right. You know, but even, even in a fire where, I, you know, that was one of the first things that got saved from the house mm -hmm. and that our house burned down, which it didn't. So, yeah. Uh, so it's been quite a journey of kids and being married and my faith. What, what else do you want to ask me? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That definitely deserves a book. <laughs> yeah, it sure does. That's you know, the short version, I'm sure. I'm sure. The book ended when I was 21 and found out I was pregnant for the first time. My book went so you haven't even, yeah. I have not even it stepped is, into everything else. I have a I have a file for it and I have things started, but I have not written book two yet. Mm. Mm, I can't wait. Right. I'm excited. <laughs> So with having um 18 children, as I as I um I come from a big family, mm -hmm. how was cooking? <laughs> how was cooking? How oh, was great question. <laughs> um yeah. You know, people Thanksgiving's coming up and mm -hmm. people are always like, yeah, I've I've got uh I've got to cook for 12 people and I was <laughs> and like, you're like ha. Huh. I cook for 14 every day, right? Um, it's interesting because when we knew, like, on one end, I had three kids in diapers. And, you know, then Dane's kids came on and his oldest three kids were the same age as my kids. We have three 21-year-olds, you know, two 23-year-olds, two 25-year-olds. Two 25 mm -hmm. um, his kids kind of blended into the same ages as my kids. So that part was really great. Um when they all started moving out, it was like, we knew on the front end, it was going to be tons of diapers on the back end. It's like a mass exodus. They're all mm -hmm. moving out at the same time. <laughs> and, it, and it was, I mean, almost everyone lives in the Reno area and um, they're all super close and we're close to most of them. I mean, I have a, out of the 17 kids, because my son passed away out of the 17 kids, I am not close to three of them. Hmm. Hmm. And I am very close to the rest of them. And I would prefer to be close to all of them. That's not my choice. Right. However, like statistically, I'm doing pretty well. Yeah. And and yeah. I think kids, when they become adults, really need to kind of work that out. So cooking. Mm -hmm. I was cooking for 14 people every single night. How did that look? Wow. Interesting. Um, you know, I had a chore wheel first. I had, and we would turn it. We would turn names and so that... I oh, had cool. two two layers of kids, right? So I had two wheels that had kids' names on mm -hmm. them. So you exactly. turn them. Well, oh. yeah. So you would turn them. So they were always there were always two of them, but they were mm -hmm. matched with different siblings. And mm -hmm. then also you turned it. The outside wheel were the chores. The chore. And we made nice. Things. We menu planned and um, she did homeschooling. So she has like all this. <laughs> I did not. I homeschooled for over a decade. Then I did not homeschool for 15 okay. years. And then okay, I started. Wow. I was working a job. I was working yeah. a job some of the time. Um, groceries. We spent more on groceries than we did on our house payment. So oh wow. I mean, back then, my house payment went from like. Twelve to fourteen hundred dollars, and mm -hmm. we spent more than that on groceries. Oof. So that gives you an yeah. idea. Um, probably up between three hundred fifty and four hundred dollars a week. Wow! Um, and as the kids got older, it became more because of yes. the, like the bo teenage boys. Boys, I know. <laughs> yes, teenagers. Sure, no, yep. I know all about it. Yep. So I have, I have been really planned for like 30 years now. And wow. um, I was not a good cook. I'm an exceptionally great cook now. I don't <laughs> love cooking, but I've gotten really good at it. And, you know, we did a lot of, I use the slow cooker all the time. Mm -hmm. That's really Yes. Mm -hmm. So I liked things where I could kind of dump everything in and I let it cook for a second. <laughs> It was a necessity. I mean, we had 12 kids at home. I mean, nine to 12 kids for years. I had nine to 12 kids. 
And um, I worked through a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. had to figure out how to do meals differently. Um, I also ate really healthy too. And mm -hmm. that was important to me. There's a balance between spending the money and eating as healthy as you want to and how much yeah. it costs yeah. mm -hmm. and craft macaroni and cheese and hot dogs. And like, there's this massive gap between the two. Yeah. And so you organic you, and stuff like that. Yeah. That's yeah, I could, yeah. We, couldn't. we couldn't do all organic and all perfectly mm -hmm. healthy all the time. But I got very, very good at doing things healthy. I used things that people don't even know what they are. There's something called TVP, total vegetable protein. They're like these little nuggets. It's vegetable protein. That's it. But mm -hmm. they're, it's, mm -hmm. it kind of looks like grape nuts, light okay. colored grape nuts, right? But the consistency, they're not heavy like grape nuts. It's okay. real light, light. Mm -hmm. like a, um, yeah. So what you can do is you can buy TVP and add it to anything with meat in it. You can do half and half because it's just okay. a vegetable protein it's a vegetable, and it's good yeah. for you and it's inexpensive. So like one trick I had was if something called for two pounds of ground beef, I could use a pound of ground beef and then the vegetable protein and you'd never yeah. know the difference. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So there were a lot of tricks. I bought things in bulk. Mm -hmm. um, which that is more too. expensive on the front end, but it does work. It lasts longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It lasts mm -hmm. longer. And so I got really, really good at doing like casserole type dishes or crock pot mm -hmm. type, or like the rice cooker was on the counter. I had the biggest rice cooker. Like it's probably <laughs> like a church would buy it or a, a retirement home. Like you're feeding 50 people. <laughs> the big so I had the biggest, oh the big one, the biggest skillet, the biggest rice cooker, the biggest. So we would have a pot of rice always on the counter and I would make a lot of scrambled eggs and keep them in a container in the fridge. So my kids nice. loved egg and rice burritos, eggs and rice were two inexpensive things mm -hmm. with, with tortillas. So like that was a great snack. It was a great wow. lunch. It was a great breakfast. Um, I had one son who would eat almost no vegetables, but unless he put a one on everything. So he put a one on everything. The kid would eat a bowl of spinach if he could put a one on it. Oh, oh wow. Oh my goodness. Like don't ask, just eat spinach. <laughs> I don't care. I have some carrots. <laughs> um, another one that was like that with ketchup. So, I mean, obviously I had to let some things go because I right. couldn't maintain the finances of it, but also I don't, didn't have the time. I mean, one thing about Thanksgiving is that you're doing like a 30 course meal for 14 right. people. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was cooking that volume, but in a different way. And, um, you just get really good at shopping, right. really good yeah. at sales, really good yep. at coupons, really routine. good at menu routine. planning. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. I was very, very good at routine, very good at routine. And I don't know if I was naturally super organized and think out of the box to figure stuff out or if having that many kids brought that out in me. It's like a chicken egg thing. It doesn't really matter. I got real good at cooking, really good at thinking out of the box, really good at, you know, making a large amount of food um, all at once really quick from the stuff that's in your refrigerator type right. thing. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about all this is that I did that for so many years. I mean, I have no idea how many years I should like go back and really try to count how many years I had eight to 12 kids, even if you just did eight to 12. Like, I, I don't even, I don't even know. It's, it's a lot, a lot of years and um, probably at least 15. Mm -hmm. I would say. So you get really good at it. So there's a point yeah. where we had like several kids moving out, like all at the same time. And we went to the grocery store because we still menu plan. We still, I still do it the same way. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had to get ground beef and I picked up the five pound container and Dane goes, Jen, there's four of us at home right now. You don't need the five pounds. How much do you need? And I started to cry in the grocery aisle. I don't know. I have no idea how to do this. You don't know how to make small boys. So four people. I, 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 legitimately, this man is the most amazing human being, right? He hugs me and it's all right. We're going to figure oh, it out. We'll just go through, we'll go through each so meal and how much do we need. Right. In the worst case scenario, we'll have leftovers and freeze them. And this, so a month ago, we had a get together. We have a daughter who's in the military and she's going um, TDY. She's going away for like five months. Um, okay. 
to a pretty dangerous location. So we wanted to have a goodbye party and Bree, mm -hmm. it's at Bree's house. Bree's got the house that we, we all meet at Bree's house, right? So we okay. go to Bree's house. So <laughs> she says, mom, make your macaroni salad. We haven't had it in a while, like make your macaroni salad. And I'm like, awesome. And I'm in the kitchen making it and Dane's like, holy cow, how many people? <laughs> you I, and I have this one bowl, it's like, like I can just, I, just like, a <laughs> I, I gotta show you this bowl at some point. Like, it is this big around, and I can barely. I got my spoon. I can barely. It's spilling out because I can barely do it. And, I, and I'm like, I'm cooking for the kids. <laughs> It was gone. It was gone. I brought this bowl See? in and they were like, yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. Mom's back. We Mom's yep. back. <laughs> it was gone. So yeah, I mean, you know, you just, you, it's interesting though. Now the kids are asking for recipes that they grew up on. And wow. because I cooked so much from scratch, like their whole lives, I made all their Halloween costumes from scratch. Oh, I served nice. them pajamas for Christmas every single year. Um, until about 10 years ago when I'm like, you guys are too big and materials too expensive. I don't have the time to do this. Like it's ridiculous. <laughs> so we went and bought them. I would make them the, I would buy t-shirts and make some, there was a theme for each t-shirt and they bought, they went and picked out their own christmas mm -hmm. bottoms oh, pajama okay. bottoms okay so right. anyway i sewed all their stuff i made all their stuff so now <laughs> my daughter's like yeah can um like can i have like your chili recipe and she was at the house and i'm like it's right here so if you want to like screenshot that and she goes okay blah, 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 blah. she's reading down and she goes oh. like mom this sounds like super intensive <laughs> and i'm like every time you ate chili that's the recipe i use every time and, and she's like so is there a really healthy canned option yeah there is actually there is like let me she's like yeah <laughs> nah. yeah if you want the healthiest over-the-counter inexpensive pre-made chili it is this brand and she goes, i think i'm gonna be screenshotting that one that's so now like they realize not only was i cooking for 14 right. kids i legitimately i cooked stuff. everything from yeah. scratch and although i got good at making it fast and easy mm -hmm. and like dump it all in the crock pot or make a casserole um that that was like i that was a skill that i <laughs> yes. had to learn and it <laughs> was good. hard mm -hmm. yeah That's so amazing. i mean you i don't i don't have any secret to it except when you have to do it you figure it you out just do it yeah, yeah you just do it i think, being being a mom, mom. I think yeah. that's a part of us being women and moms like mm -hmm. you know it gotta get done we'll figure it out <laughs> no it does and hey, we just do it we just right. do it. sometimes we're just like we'll sit there and just be like okay we gotta do it we yeah do it. like even th sometimes we gotta think quick though because you know it, it's too much going on when it comes to our kids right you know one of the things that i did because i had all this training and then after i did 12 years of foster care i actually worked in foster care and i i worked at a nonprofit. i recruited and trained foster parents work with treatment level kids which are the toughest of the tough kids mm -hmm. they are the ones that are in and out of mental health facilities or juvenile okay. detentions and they've experienced the most traumatic abuse oh. and i worked with them for a few years and with the parents and so i was a trainer of trainers right mm -hmm. i could train you to be a trainer on suicide awareness and prevention. So mm -hmm. I, I had a lot of skills and a lot of, I, have, I had a lot of resources at my disposal. And one of the best things that I did was they have love languages for kids that you can do mm -hmm. free as a, like of all the training, my first thing I would tell you as a parent is take love languages for yourself yes. and take love languages for kids. And it's so interesting out of all of these kids, I am an even split between quality time and physical touch there's there's nothing about that you need to know except those usually you are one dominant i am equally mm -hmm. dominant in those mm -hmm. two interesting and mm -hmm. most of my kids are either quality time or physical touch odd right that's a, there's a nature versus nurture thing going on here one of my boys though and he's one of the kids that i had that was the easiest for me closest relationship but one thing that i um I had a rule on when the kids went shopping with me, which they did. I took them everywhere and they knew mm -hmm. if you act up, 
I will leave my cart and go home and you will not be happy. It will not be looking good for you. So you can mm -hmm. make the choice to act up or you right. can make the choice because if you act up, there's going to be consequences. But if not, we're probably going to have a good time. And one of my rules with shopping was don't ask, can we get this? Can we get this? Can mm -hmm. we get this? Mm -hmm. And there's two reasons. It's very disrespectful for a kid to keep asking that over and over again. So teaching them a matter of right. having respect. Yeah. And also I felt bad because I didn't have the finances to be able to get all of the right. things that I wanted. And for kids, it looks like you know, as a parent, you're putting everything in the cart you want. Mm -hmm. Why can't I put some things in the cart that I, I want? want right? yeah. Even though that's not what it what it is. So um, what I had them do was say, mom, did you see this? Okay. And there are sometimes I'm like, I did not see that. And I would like those 10 bucks discount macaroni and cheese in my cart right now. And other times like I did see that. And that's something that we can think about and put on the menu plan another time. So we had an engagement that was more positive than right. them whining and nagging and asking and me getting more and more angry. Mm -hmm. So when he was the kid that was very good at asking if I saw this, did you, Hey mom, did you see this? Hey mom, did you see this? And although he was following the rule, it was a little stressful going shopping and we did love languages and his love language is gifts. Mm -hmm. love language is gifts there you go he wants stuff because that's how he feels loved mm -hmm. <laughs> and i remember taking the test and he was probably like seven or eight and i looked at him and i was like buddy i am so sorry <laughs> <laughs> like my poor little dude right you didn't know that was his oh, yeah. yeah get to know your kids because yep. you don't you think you know yeah. your kids. You, you don't you don't know your mm -hmm. kids one they hide a lot from you Yep. And two, you don't know them, mm -hmm. not because yep. you don't want to, but because you don't. Don't take so them do So that right. they that you get to know your kids, and love language is one of them. And every and single time I went to the so store, so much. Oh. Yes. When I found yeah. out my son's love language words of affirmation, I was just like, "Oh, this is so easy! Like he plays sports. This is this is his go moment. So like, yeah, so proud of you, bud. And mm -hmm. he just glow, like it just he glows, you know, and right? It, yeah, it makes your life a little bit easier too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it does. Be well, because I want to be shown, I want to feel love from people. Mm -hmm. And gifts isn't it. You can buy me things, though. I'm right. still, I'm grateful for the time you spent thinking about me. Mm -hmm. I'm quality time. See? See how I just twisted gifts? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, and so from that moment on, I would get like a pack of gum. 30 mm -hmm. cents, 50 just cents. Stuff. Right. Not for anybody else, for him. No one else even noticed that he was getting something that they weren't. Why? It's not mm -hmm. their love language. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I remember one time being in the store and um, grabbing a pack of gum and saying, hey, or saying, like, which pack of gum do you want? And, like, you can carry it through the store. I'm going to get you this. And then there was something else. And he said, Mom, did you see that? And I said, I didn't see that, but you can get it. And he started to cry. He was probably mm -hmm. 10 or 11 at that point. He started to cry and he just, and he wouldn't look at me. He just walked next to me and he goes, Thank you, Mom. It just means so much. Aww. Aww. just get to know your kids so mm -hmm. that's i don't know how i got off on that tangent <laughs> okay but oh, anyway shopping, I mean. it's okay it's okay <laughs> <Squirrel>. <laughs> um yeah so that was that was a good one um you know there's a comment about suicide prevention so can i share my one of my absolutely yeah i have had three kids that i know of that have had suicide attempts all of them unsuccessful thankfully and um, one of them I caught and I had all the training, right? I, I was licensed to take on the toughest situations in my home. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was my daughter and her mm -hmm. sister figured it out first. Because, you know, you you do urgent care and then you wait for a couple hours. Right. And in that couple hours, like she was really sick. In that couple hours, her sister that's two years older figured it out. And she said, I'm going to the doctor with you and mom. And if you don't tell her, I will. And we went to the doctor's office. And I remember the doctor saying, you know, have you used a tampon? What's the last thing that you ate? And I'm thinking toxic shock, food poisoning. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going through like this is what she's ruling out. Right. And all of a sudden I looked at my daughter and I said, I'm pretty sure I know what's going on right now. And I really hope that I'm not right. But if I am, we need to move this conversation in a different direction. And Gabby said, my, my, her older sister said, uh -huh. if you don't tell them right now, I'm going to tell them. So she was brought to the hospital in an ambulance and I followed behind her. And we got to the hospital, you know, at two in the morning, 
she she took every non prescription pill that she possibly could in the house. And Tylenol is actually one of the worst. And so she was so sick and her stomach was hurting her because she was reacting. So they, they, um, you know, they hooked her up. We stayed in the ER in the little room. They were monitoring her blood every hour to make sure that her liver and kidney, her functions were not getting worse. Mm -hmm. And when she hit a certain point that her levels were considered, well, they knew that they were going to continue to go down and Mm -hmm. she was in a safer zone for not having kidney failure, liver failure. Um, the social worker for the hospital came into the office, uh, into the room, and he said, are you comfortable bringing your daughter home? And I said, I am 100% not comfortable because I know that when a success, when, a, when an attempt is unsuccessful and everybody goes, oh, whew, we're all relieved. We caught this. I'm, I'm here for you. I'm Thank there you. for you. If they have another attempt, it is almost 100% successful. Mm-hmm. I work. I have 11 other children at home. My husband works and there is no way that I can give her the one-on-one level of attention that she needs in this situation. So because I worked in the industry, I said, where I would like to bring her is this program. I want her in the 10 day program and I need you to make that happen for me. And he did. And at like six in the morning, we left the hospital and we drove there. I dropped her off for the 10 day program and They put everything that she owned in a bag and she was dressed in the, you know, the hospital gown, Mm -hmm. sobbing and screaming with her arms around my waist, begging me not to leave her there. And I peeled her arms off me with the help of a nurse. And I, um, the two nurses, I put her with the other nurse and they held her down screaming and I turned around and I walked away. It was the best thing I could have ever done for her mental health. And it was one of the most difficult moments that I've ever faced as a parent. And I think if, since I'm giving advice, unsolicited advice, if I could give you some advice in parenting, it is one, know your limitations and two, never be ashamed by them. I did, there wasn't a level of training I could have had that was higher than the level of training that I had. And I knew because of that That's level good. of training that I was not, that I needed help. Mm-hmm. It takes a village. So find them, ask for help yeah. and yes. elicit their help. And she spent that 10 days there and she has been on my podcast two or three times. Nice. This last September, she called me. Oh, well, I mean, I see her all the time, but she called me up one day in August and she said, mom, I need to be on your podcast again. Like, <laughs> this is it. We're going to tell the world. My podcast is where they're going to hear it from, right? Mm -hmm. I need to be on your podcast again. I know that the pandemic, what the levels of emotional health and how much they've declined Mm -hmm. in my peer group. She's 19 now. This happened five years ago. It was five. November 7th was five years. And it Mm -hmm. happened to be the sister that caught it. It was on her birthday. So her birthday has always been a little tough. It's her five year anniversary of me catching her suicide. So, um, she wanted to be on the podcast again. And she and another another one of my daughters has been on. And actually, I learned a, about her, all of her suicide attempts, my older daughter. Wow. On my podcast. I did not know. And I did not know what saved her life on the last one. And it was my youngest daughter. And I didn't know until she was telling me on the podcast. It mm-hmm. is. I've cried twice in four and a half years. Mm. And that was one of them, finding out all the stuff that was happening. The with details of everything. That I didn't wow. know. So, so my older daughter came on once by herself. She and that daughter came on together a year ago to talk about suicide awareness because September is uh, Suicide mm-hmm. Awareness mm-hmm. Month. And there's a week, like the 7th, um, the 7th to the 14th, that's Suicide Awareness and Prevention Week. And so they were on a year ago. So Kez called me and she's like, I need to be on again. My peers are really hurting and people Mm. need to know, Mm. including herself. Two months prior to that, she came over and I looked at her and I said, are you suicidal? And she said no for about an hour. And I just asked her probably five or six times. And finally she broke down and she said, I am suicidal. And I said, do you need me to set you up with additional help? Or do you think this is something that we can discuss and work through? And we discussed it and worked through yeah. it. However, she did, to be on my podcast, um, the podcast is called At a Crossroads with the Naked Podcaster. And the podcast is, um, when it came out, I said, I'm going to do research on statistics and you need to do research by 
calling into the suicide hotline. Mm-hmm. And that served two purposes. It was research for her and that was the mm-hmm. catalyst behind it. But I wanted her to have conversations about her mental health. Yeah. And mm-hmm. she did. And so she came on and she talked about it on the podcast. It was See? really awesome. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. That was one of the hardest things. And then I think the next hardest thing was losing my son. Mm-hmm. I don't know that one is more than the other, but right. I, you know, with 18 kids and foster care and all the different places this, these kids came from and look, you take them out of a system. I took these kids out of a system mm-hmm. where they were being abused and neglected right? and put them right back into a system where they're abused and neglected. And that sounds odd, right? I didn't personally, it wasn't at my hand that they were abused and neglected, but kids, you know, six of my kids that I had with my ex-husband came forward and reported a family member who was abusive. And I went to court on their behalf um, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And so other people can abuse your children, people that are close Mm -hmm. to you, people that they know, Mm -hmm. people that you trust. Um, They've been bullied. They've been through, you know, the gamut of what we all have gone through growing right. up. Your kids are put back into the system in the sense that they're going to experience dysfunction, abuse, neglect, all of it in one yeah. way or another at your hand or not. And so knowing that you are unintentionally or inadvertently or even not at your hand, putting your children in dysfunction right into the same system that you wish to save them from goes a long way in in you realizing that you can then turn around and make a difference because now you're Mm -hmm. working within a dysfunctional system where your children are experiencing abuse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a really tough thing as a parent because you, they're born and you're like that all your joy, all your hopes, all your dreams, all the mistakes you don't want to make, everything you've experienced that you don't want your kids to go through or that your friends have experienced that you don't want right. Your kids to go through, right? Yeah. <laughs> we put all this on them like it's magic fairy dust and it doesn't exist. The spindle is alive and it's well. Still, right. Mm-hmm. And they're going to find it. So one way or another, these kids are experiencing a lot. And I just tangent it again. I'm very good at that. Um, but for more unsolicited advice is that know that you're damaging your kids Mm -hmm. and own it and apologize for it and move forward through it. Be accountable, right? Be accountable and move through it, right? So, um, that's a really tough thing. It's hard to be a parent. And even if there were an owner's manual, which I don't think there should be. Nope. Every kid's different. Every parent's Mm -hmm. different. Yeah. Every situation's different, even with the same kid. And so, you know, I think we need to give each other ourselves and each other a lot more grace. When you see that mama with a screaming two-year-old in the supermarket, say, is there anything I can do to help? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. We never know what people are really going through. No. Yeah. In that moment or when they're home. <laughs> mm-hmm. You don't. So I think... You know, grace with yourself and grace with each other goes an awful long way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. It Absolutely. Does. Now that I've tangented, dial me back in. <laughs> <laughs> I just have an interesting question. Okay. I'm just curious to know how many bathrooms were in your house. <laughs> uh, I'm just thinking about mornings and I'm just like, this is getting a little bit more interesting than I expected. <laughs> so here's the thing. One, we're minimalists, which is a complete change in attitude in how you own stuff and stuff owns you and what that means. We weren't always, which is why we are now. Mm-hmm. Our house was totally overwhelming. If you think just 12 backpacks and 12 pairs of shoes and they kids don't have necessarily one backpack and one pair of shoes. Like it was just so much stuff. Mm-hmm. And so about seven years ago, we decided it wasn't working for us anymore. And we got rid of about 80% of what we own, which seems impossible unless you're a hoarder. And I'm here to tell you, Wow. You're all hoarders and you can get rid of 80% of what you own. I did it. And I've got pictures and I documented wow. the horrifying journey. So anyway, one thing is we're minimalist. So that really helped. The other thing is that in a home, what space do you use 95% of the time? Your kitchen, your dining room, your living room. Living room. Mm-hmm. It was really important for us. One, nobody makes eight bedroom houses. It just, it's like, and I couldn't have afforded it anyway. Right. Um, So what was the most important for us was to have homes that we've lived in that have that kitchen, dining, living room space that's real open where Mm -hmm. we can really connect as a family. 
-hmm. And it's kind of the overflow for some stuff, right? Like right. toys, toys did not go in my kid's room. You had your bed and your clothes. Shoes did mm -hmm. not go in my kid's room. There was okay. a, a bucket by the door where everybody's shoes went. It was like a rubber made tote. And oh, wow. the reason is because I'm not looking through my house for 12 kids shoes. <laughs> right. We're leaving. The bus is coming. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we put things in places maybe differently than a lot of other families that, you know, the shoes went by the door, the coats mm -hmm. went by the door, the backpacks went by the door. So an entryway was important to us. And then right. setting that up so that it was very functional was important. The kitchen, dining, living room was important. And our living room was always a place where all the toys went. There were no TVs, no Xboxes, no toys, no none right. of that stuff went in the bedrooms. So we put the emphasis on the area of the house that we spent the most time is we, we in. The other thing we did was we used bedrooms for only sleeping. So we right. had most of the time <laughs> four bedrooms and two and a half bathrooms. Wow. Hmm. So <clears throat> we had five boys in the biggest room, okay. four girls and three girls. There was a girl's bathroom and a, and the half bathroom. The girls use the bathroom most of the time to get ready. The boys use the half bathroom. Showers happen. Okay. We split the kids. Half the showers were at night and half were in the morning. Hot water, time, the whole thing. So uh, the boys would usually shower at night in the bathroom. Okay. And then they get ready in the morning in the half bathroom and the girls opposite, they would shower and all get ready. Cause like I'm, I've always been, I know it's going to be shocking, but I'm super open. If you come in my bedroom and bathroom, like girls, come on in, mm -hmm. probably going to be naked. If you don't like it, get out of my bedroom and bathroom. <laughs> right. If you're a boy and you're like over like seven, don't come in my bedroom and bathroom. Mm -hmm. So I would get ready in the morning in my bedroom and, and Dane leaves for work at four and he okay. always has. So basically once the kids started getting up at five, my bedroom and bathroom was also like the overflow and we would all kind of get ready together. Uh -huh. And my kids grow, grew up being very comfortable with the fact that I was a woman who have a, and I have a body. Mm -hmm. I, I know. Um, and they are also young ladies who have, all the same equipment and I have kids with very great self-esteem who are awesome. not uncomfortable being naked in the bedroom with me. So <laughs> yeah. Um, that's kind of how we did it. We just arranged the house. I guess if I were to like set your house up right now, it would be set up in zones. Mm, I like that. The it's zones, like <laughs> right. The zones have a purpose. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing else goes in that zone and everything we need needs to be in that zone. And then how do we make it work the best? Right. And so it worked. Wow. It worked. Good. Yeah. One of the biggest problems I had when, when I had a lot of kids and they were younger and again, I had eight to 11 kids right. even when they were all little. Right. I was washing so many cups. I just like, you know, you get thirsty, you get a cup, you get a drink, you put it on the counter. You don't remember which one's yours. I don't know which one's mine. And <laughs> right. I, I was losing my mind at the volume of dishes. I, I didn't have enough cups, right? And so I color coded my. I'm about to say color. That's what <laughs> you get. This color towel, you get this color cup, and that is that. <laughs> Everyone. So Brianna was purple, you know, like. Yes. <laughs> There Olivia you go. was green. Alana is <laughs> orange. Nicholas is mm -hmm. yellow. Taylor is blue. I, I, they are still color. They still, are, they got to pick their favorite color Aww, when they were nice. little. And I bought plates, cups, bowls, and their color. utensils, That's awesome. mm -hmm. their blanket for their bed, the towel for the bathroom. I freaking rainbowed my house because. <laughs> but it worked. Who left the towel on the floor? You already know. <laughs> <laughs> That's an orange towel, Gabby, Lana. That's pink. I know that. <laughs> right. Gabby, it's freaking pink. Pick up your towel. So, I mean, really, you as as another piece of unsolicited advice, as a mom, as a parent, as a dad, what's causing stress? Cups right. were causing stress. Mm -hmm. That seems ridiculous, but it was causing me an a tremendous amount of stress and time. And it was the stupidest thing to be stressed and spend time doing. Mm -hmm. So once you realize what the stress is and where it's coming from, the next step is to think of an out of the box solution. Yes. How can I make it not putting your house into zones is one way. Color coding your kids is another way. Minimalism is huge. So yeah. Yeah. 
And that that also takes creativity because it does. Know, it sure does. It really someone does. that doesn't have that mindset, they literally probably would have had depression or just really stressed out because it's like, how do I make this work? You know, mm -hmm. that that does take um, a lot of creativity as a mom, you know? Yeah, you have to. I mean, and that's why I said earlier, like, I'm not sure which came first. <laughs> I. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I was super good at it or if I had to become super good mm -hmm. at it for things to function better or a combination of both. But yeah. I, I know I have a very visual, very logical personality. I do not get emotional about most stuff. You know, I just don't think it's worth the effort to get emotional about things that don't warrant it. Right. And um, when there's a problem, there's I have a friend who is like, you, you always have a plan B. And I'm like, there's like more letters in the alphabet than that. Like there's lots of plans. Right. We could be on X right now. I don't know. But, you know, I mean, really, if that doesn't work, well, okay, why and what then? And just move on. So, yeah. Yeah, I love it. Wow. You should definitely have book more than one book. <laughs> I'm, I'm I, may, I, may have to call you, I may have to call you to give me some ideas <laughs> All right. okay i'm ready i'm ready <laughs> yeah um also um can you tell us a little bit about your business and how it's and how it is to help de uh, it's designed to help others i'm so sorry i'm sorry that's okay. I've been a coach for the last four years. So I took all the training I had in every corporate job and a tremendous amount from working in foster care and all the mm -hmm. training that I had. Right. I realized that, you know, I, I could teach conflict resolution and stress reduction and suicide awareness. And those were really negative sort of ER kind of mentalities. And mm -hmm. although mm -hmm. if and when that's an issue, you do need to have an ER protocol for it. For the most part, that's really not the space you should be coming from. So I also have needed and wanted to do a lot of work on myself. And mm -hmm. some of that has been traditional talk therapy. And it's been a lot of different things. And I took the type of therapy that I got the further the fastest with okay. in my own healing journey. Because mm -hmm. I had to get past traumas. Yeah, I didn't yes. perpetuate the cycle, but I still have my own like backpack of rocks that I'm carrying mm -hmm. around as baggage, mm -hmm. right? So it was important to me that as anything in my life was triggering something that was negative, that I became curious and investigated. So I became licensed in the therapy that worked the best for me. Right. It's, mm -hmm. I'm an NLP practitioner and I use that in my coaching. So basically I'm coming from a super positive way. I tend to work predominantly with Christian women. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but like you're checking the boxes. You got the house, the marriage, going to college, um, 2.3 kids, the job, you're doing the things and you love all of that. You, you don't not love your life. And yet you wake up and think, but is this all there is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or like I did 17 years ago, 18 years ago, when I left a cult and a marriage, you realize that you've hit the bottom and you have no idea where your identity comes from anymore. You've kind of lost it. You've mm -hmm. lost your sense of who yep. you are. So I have a 12 week program. Um, I break it down into like three months and three kind of topics. It's career relationship and purpose. Mm. So people think I'm a life coach, which is interesting because like insert name of coach here, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I list it's listed as transformational coach coach because we can love a lot of things about our life and still feel unfulfilled or, right. mm -hmm. or like yeah. something's missing missing mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> and that's where i step in um in that we do it's a group program and it actually starts january 3rd 2022 i'm looking okay. for 10 women and in that i do three one-on-one -on -one. so once a month you get a one-on-one -on -one session with me for 90 minutes where we talk confidence is that's this is where my therapy comes in the strongest or the most directly because i'm using it through everything however this is where we we work on your specific traumas that are creating mm -hmm. issues with you and okay. i feel very grateful because so i was molested i i lost my virginity to date rape 
I went through infertility. I've had miscarriages. I've gone through divorce as a Christian woman. Um, you know, I've failed forward a lot. I lost a son to death and I've had kids that have had suicide attempts. And I've been through, if you, you can give me any topic and I'll tell you which child I went through that mm, subject. Yes, with. you have so much experience. I, mm. I have 30 years and a lot of training of experience. So I love the one-on-ones because when we can really break through our personal traumas, we come out mm -hmm. on the side, the best version of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's like what that. I do. That's amazing. Awesome. And where can they, if anyone wants to sign up, where can they sign up? Um, to uh, join the classes for 2022 of January. Momof18.com is the website. It has all, like any way you want to get in touch with me, the contact form, my email, my Google voice, every social media platform I'm on. If, if you prefer Instagram, go there, find me on Instagram and message, message <laughs> me. Having said that, I have a private Facebook group and that is where everyone goes. I have a lot of coaches in there because I want people to have resources outside of myself. Um, right. It's also where all of the exclusive content and free content. So I do more in that group. And that is also where coaching clients are. So momof18.com, you can find me. And what you should do is just get into the private Facebook group. Awesome. That's amazing. I love it. So is there anything else you like to share or discuss that we didn't um, that we didn't cover in an hour and a half? Um, <laughs> I know, we love we're going to do like a part two. <laughs> I'm in. So I would love to leave you on a very positive note. The number one thing that I would recommend or suggest um, to do to make an impact in your life. You ready? Can we end that way? Oh, we have a question. Well, let, before you go into go, that, go, go, let's go. Uh, go into, we did have some questions. Let me make sure we answered all the questions. Sorry. No problem. There's a Marcus. He's such a fan. <laughs> Shout out to Marcus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm scrolling. Sorry. <laughs> you, do, you, you do it. <laughs> Um, this was a good one. Uh, he asked, well, we'll just answer a couple of his questions. Yep. Um, he asked, how do you coach others to avoid cults? I don't know that I actually do specifically coach others. I think when people recognize they're in a bad relationship, um, or they're in a situation religiously, I would definitely be able to co to coach someone, but to coach you on, not getting into one, I'd mm -hmm. say if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. And right. I think in Christianity, if I could tell my younger self something, it would be to decide what was really important to me. Okay. And one thing that personally was really important to me was line upon line. I, I need a religion to teach directly from scripture, line by line, and so that it is not misconstrued. Mm. That is super important. If uh, someone is using any other reading material other than the Bible. I'm not talking like a book that maybe somebody recommends. I mean, if right. they are teaching out of a book that is like run, just run. Um, and that, I mean, there are other things if it's too good to be true, if they're asking you to give certain things up, if things in your life are being controlled, things that like a church really doesn't have much business, what you eat, mm -hmm. what you okay. drink, yeah. um, there can be guidelines, but I'm not talking about guidelines. Like, you know, if R rated movies and horror movies go against your Christian beliefs, don't watch them. Right. Like, okay, enough said, right? <laughs> so, but I'm, I'm talking like at a higher level of control. Anytime someone's going to try to control things about your life through the church and use the church mm -hmm. as that, or if there is a person or if it's not God and it's not Christ that you are okay. following and praying to, if there's somebody else who's a human being that um, you have to kind of get through to get to God, that's a problem. That's a problem. And yeah, I mean, r really, it's so insidious and so slow and so appealing that it's hard in the beginning to recognize. But just know, I mean, when you learn line by line from the scriptures, you realize that 
getting into heaven is not based on works and it's not based on prosperity. So if people are yes. teaching that you have to do things to get into mm -hmm. heaven, yeah. or in there, you know, that's wrong. that you have to give <laughs> yeah, money, mm -hmm. you have to give money to the church to get in it. Like, Warning! You work your way. <laughs> no, 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 you can't buy your way or work your way into into God's grace. So, right, I agree. I totally agree. Yes, definitely. Um, he did ask in regards to, you know, having different children in the house, and you had spoke about um, making crock pot dinners and you know just making things easier for everyone. Um, how did you accommodate everyone's appetite? Was there I mean, did they, if you don't eat it, you don't eat or did yes, they have any allergies that you had to deal, you know what I'm saying? Like, how did you accommodate with all that? There were a couple special considerations for eating. Okay. Outside of that. Um, I, you know, I didn't, I don't think I raised super, super picky eaters. And that That's kind good. of starts at the beginning. That's good. When That's you're really making awesome. eater, right? <laughs> right. So here's the thing. If you don't like dinner, I'll see you for breakfast in the morning. Cause you're not going hungry. You don't have to eat dinner. I'll see you for mm -hmm. breakfast. This isn't Burger King. You don't get it your own way. There is no second dinner. There's no snacking after dinner. Like after dinner, I closed the kitchen and I was, right. it was done. So uh, I mean, I think I set some boundaries. Boundaries is a big word that you should investigate yes. using in your yes. journey, right? I definitely agree. I'm using um, zones. You got me. Zone four is closed at 11 o'clock. Right. Like <laughs> the, the zone is closed. So I would make dinner and we would clean up dinner right afterwards and the kitchen was closed and my kids knew the kitchen was closed and if they really didn't want dinner if they weren't hungry they didn't like it i'll see you for breakfast they are not going to starve in the okay. next 10 hours so <laughs> yes that is true i didn't have super super picky eaters when that happened they got to choose three things that they did not have to i love the number three science proves it i didn't know that back then but <laughs> i love the number three so they could choose three things they didn't have to eat and it couldn't be vegetables it had to be <laughs> may not <laughs> right it had to be carrots rice uh -huh. cheerios mm -hmm. and if i made if you're if one of the three things was rice and i made rice you could remove it from your plate you have to in my house take a tasting bite of everything mm -hmm. you have to try everything if you don't want more than a tasting bite, that's okay. But you mm -hmm. have to take a tasting bite. Tasting bite. And um, we did other things like, you know, make food fun. First of all, we, we did this thing once, like we would buy a weird fruit every week. So like the star fruit, fruits that are just no, like, I, they're not apples, oranges, and bananas, right? They're not, mm -hmm. not a grape. So unique and interesting fruit. It's how we tried mangoes. It's how we tried papayas. It's how we yeah, tried star fruit. Shall we have kiwi? So the kids at the grocery store, what is going to be our fun fruit to try for the week? Right? Uh -huh. Cool. So that's just a, an experiment. We don't know if we're going to like it or not. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Let's take it home and learn about it and try it. And, right. <laughs> you know, and it's fun. So expose She's your kids. Well. Also, <laughs> I did let my kids help plan the menu. Okay because I couldn't afford to let them pick a lot out at the grocery store. So they got to help plan the menu, but allowing your kids um, to be part of the planning and part of the cooking helps them want to do more of the eating. And they get excited. Yeah, they do. Yeah. We, did, we did one experiment where somebody was like, there was some commercial about a gala apple or something being the best. And one of my daughters, Ash looked at me and she's like, well, who said that the gala apple was the best one? And I was like, Oh my gosh. We're going to the store right now. We Let's bought <laughs> two of every kind of apple that we could find. <laughs> and we labeled them all on the counter and we cut them all. And then we went down the list to try it. And it was like Coke or Pepsi. <laughs> um, you know, like, I don't know. Let's figure it out. Which one? Pink Lady, by the way, was overwhelmingly the favorite. So <laughs> Bray, Bray Burn was Pink a Lady. close Ooh, Okay. But, I mean, how to not have picky eaters is what you're asking me, essentially. And one is allow them to choose three things they don't have right. to eat know mm -hmm. that the rule is that you have to take a tasting bite the mm -hmm. kitchen is closed as soon as dinner's cleaned up there is no second dinner i'll see you up for breakfast i set right. boundaries over food and so i didn't really have issues with food and That's they had a choice you know they had they yeah. had choices also i made dinner every single night and if you didn't want to eat dinner wow. you could pull out any leftover you wanted from the fridge and eat that instead mm, you had okay. leftovers 
Yeah. Not every single night all the time, but yeah, I mean, I cooked volume and yeah, we did have mm -hmm. leftovers. And so, and I also extra cooked too, cause that's what I took okay. for lunch. And right. so mm -hmm. really like you can eat any leftover in my fridge and you walk in my house right now, I'd be like, Hey, take a look in the fridge. And if there's any leftovers you want, go ahead and have right. at it. <laughs> because we need to eat them. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. We also would have leftover night where you take everything out of the fridge and put it on the counter and it's like you got to eat any combination of anything you wanted that was on the counter because we need you need to wipe them out i don't want to waste mm -hmm. food so mm -hmm. i mean really just kind of think out of the box and have fun with food and allow them to yeah. be part of it strategize i love it yeah i like that <laughs> i love it so now we can get into the final question um because we pretty much answered most of marcus's questions as we were going through Marcus, um, dude, call me, okay? Like this. Is <laughs> he's gonna be on your. He's gonna be listening to your podcast. That's what. Yeah, he's that's do. Good. <laughs> My podcast isn't about me at all, though. So. <laughs> um, he's supporting. He's a. It's, a, it's good. I love it. I love amazing it. Amazing support. He has a podcast as well. Good. So I'd love to be on. Support. Of course. Yeah. So yes, what would you like to um, discuss that we didn't cover today that can possibly help someone or your ending um, statement for today? If there's one thing I can have you do, this is without kids. I want you to write my suggestion, write three new things you're grateful for every day. I don't care if it's in the morning or in the afternoon or in the mm -hmm. evening. I don't care when you do it, but it's got to be three things. and It's got to be new things. So you can't mm -hmm. write the same things every single day. And if today it's that you woke up, if it's that you made your bed, if it's that you're breathing, that's an okay place to start. So mm -hmm. meet yourself where you're at, but three new things a day. And you know, your notepad is great, but handwriting it is better. So just yes. three things in a bullet point. That's all I want you to do. This trains mm -hmm. your brain to search for the positive in the world. In less than 21 days, you will realize that it's easy to think of three things. In less than three weeks, you'll realize that. And that's just the science behind it. And there is science behind three, which is fantastic because it's my favorite. <laughs> if you have children and you want to do a, the same thing with them, we call it HILO. I've been doing it for 25 years. Okay. So with kids, one, if you have more than one child, they each get to be center stage. They have the mic. So tell me about your day. One low, one thing about their day that wasn't that great. And I encourage you to maintain this because kids need an opportunity to have that stage and talk right. about the stuff that's mm -hmm. tough for yeah. them in their day, mm -hmm. right? As adults, we're it's growing up. Right? Yeah, yeah, it is. So they can choose one low, one thing about their day that wasn't that great. That will really help you connect with your kids. Mm -hmm. And then three things about their day that is, that's good. So the three gratitudes, the three po new positive things. And you just go around the table and do that. And you'll notice a significant change in that same 21 days, that same three weeks is that your kids also, their brains are being rewired to search for the positive in the world. And over time they'll be like, actually, I didn't really have a low today, mm -hmm. but I have more than three highs. It's a really great way to give you, make your kids feel important. It's 30 mm -hmm. minutes of your day and to really listen to them. Everyone, we have a no phone at the table policy to really spend mm -hmm. time <laughs> listening to them and what's important to them. But you're also getting them into the habit of their brain searching for the positive in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my suggestion. And that was a bomb dropping gym. <laughs> it sure is. It sure is. I love that. I that love was that. amazing. I'm sure they can take heat in and I think I want to try it too. <laughs> yeah. Let me know. You know, when my daughter came over th four months ago and I said, are you suicidal? And she said, yes, we started texting three gratitudes every morning. So I would text her three things every morning and she gets up a little later than I do. And she would text me her three things. And we did that for months and it made a significant impact. So have an accountability buddy if you want and do it via text. I mean, I don't care how you do it. I want you to train your brain to search for the positive in the world. Mm -hmm. that's what I want you to do. It'll change the chemistry of your brain. I like it because I normally just ask, how was your day in school? I don't dissect it, but like dissecting it, I get to pick his brain a little bit, you know, and sometimes he asks me, well, how was your day? And I just say good, but it's like, you know, maybe I can let him pick my brain a little bit too. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's insightful. Like when your kids are removed from you like that, like, when you do, when you say, we're going to do this new thing, it's called high low. It's mm -hmm. super fun. I want to do it every night at dinner. I need to, you to hold me accountable. So what that means is you say one low, one thing that's not good. And everybody goes, everyone. Mm -hmm. So, hmm, what was my low today? 
Well, you know, my low was, and it'll be something about your day that right. gives your kids insight that you're a human being that also has struggles sometimes. You're not yeah. telling them the big stuff. Right. Aunt Norma's in the hospital with 30 hours left to live and I can't see her. You're not sharing that. Right. right. But, you know, the dog got out of the fence today and I was so worried that she'd get hit by a car mm -hmm. and I called her. I was so glad that she came back. One of my highs is that the dog came back when I called her. Right. You know, I mean, like, yeah. I did set a rule for this high low that you need to be aware of with children because they're wily is that dinner cannot be part of the high low. My low today is what we're having for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no filter with children. <laughs> so you got to set some ground rules. Yeah, on high you and low. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like that. <laughs> no food in high low. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Jen Teller. Um, I had an amazing time with you. you I think you should go into a uh, to be a comedian as well. I don't know how you're going to tie that into your life. <laughs> I agree. I definitely agree. Just like sign me up. Sign me up. I mean, I love I mean, being on the stage. Definitely should okay. go on tour with Kevin Hart. Love it. Anyway, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to um, connecting with you for next year with your uh, 12 week sessions. I think oh. that's amazing, and um, I just enjoy. Uh, your openness to, you know, express your story. Um, and with you having a podcast, I know like talking is like our thing. So it's like, <laughs> you, is this you're, a you're, job for real? <laughs> <laughs> you're an open book, but I love it because with you, you know, being open and being genuine, you, you have a, so much experience that can help others. Um, from your your experience from raising other children and just overall, being like superwoman, you're like definitely superwoman. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. But definitely. we do ask all of our guest speakers, and this is from your perspective of what makes you uncommon. <laughs> <laughs> Besides being a superwoman. <laughs> rewind, rewind. It was actually Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman was Wonder my Woman. <laughs> I think what makes me uncommon is that I am pretty, pretty easily willing and very willing to own up to my own failures and to admit that I have trauma in my past and to do my best to work through that, but to never allow it to define me or be an excuse for my actions or behavior. And, um, yeah, I'm okay failing forward. And I think that's what made me such a great parent too, is that if there's a quota for messing it up, I exceed it. I'm a, I'm an overachiever, right? I knocked it out of the park. I'm, I'm going to do that and more. I'm going to hit that quota of failing, but I failed forward, which is different mm -hmm. than what people, and I didn't mm -hmm. sit in that failure. Yes. I used it to propel me. And I think that makes me uncommon. I love it. I do too. I love it. I love Thanks. it. I love her. Like, I love you. Yeah. I love her. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, uh, Jen, for coming on today and being a part of Uncommon Women. Thank you for all our viewers for actually tuning in today. Today was actually um, bittersweet. It is our last episode for season four. Uh, we will be going live uh, November 11th, me and Jenny Lee, to discuss some uh, new things that's going on for season five, as well as um, giving a big thank you to all of our guest speakers. I believe we had 47 uh, guest speakers this uh, season. So um, we're going to be doing a video for our guest speakers. Um, if you would like to purchase any of our apparel, you're more than welcome to go on our website at uncommonwomen.net, where we have our self-love apparel. If you would like to be a guest speaker um, for season five, uh, we are taking people for season five. You can go on the website as well and uh, fill out a form. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay uncommon. Bye. Bye.